Well, good morning. Nice, bright, sunny morning. Something I've been looking forward to, well, for almost most of the year already. Because <laughs> I'm not a winter buff. But anyways, there's supposed to be a picture of Andy Tedema's uh, grand, great-granddaughter, Nora Rita Clark. And so we were... <laughs> Wish congratulations, congratulations to Andy with the birth of his great granddaughter. And then there's also that, as some of us are aware, that Ron de Young also had a great grandson. And uh, I do not know what the situation is at the moment, but uh, much, better. much better. So, because there was. So that's something to give thanks to God for. And then also, don't forget that Thursday evening there is the congregational meeting and hope to see you there. And then now I'll turn it over to Pastor Derek Ellens from uh, Ingersoll and he's full of vim and vigor yet because he said it was a short drive, so he's not tired. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, good morning again. As John said, my name is Derek Ellens. I'm from Ingersoll, and uh, I'm one of the few pastors that made it here without getting pulled over by the cops on the way. <laughs> so I count that as a blessing as well. Yeah, praise God for that. Um, yeah, it's a joy and a privilege to lead you in worship this morning and share God's word with you. And God calls each and every one of us to worship this morning. We recognize that as Christians, that it's actually the Holy Spirit that stirred inside of us, that got us out of bed this morning and brought us to this place or led us to turn on the, the TV and, or laptop or wherever we're watching and participate in worship in that way. And God leads us into worship with these words this first week after Easter from 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of his son, Jesus. Now let's take a minute just in silent prayer to reflect on that good news and prepare our hearts for the rest of this worship service. Now I invite you all to rise in body or in spirit. And I think there's some people who are still making their way in. And God greets each and every one of us this morning to say to each of you, I'm so happy you're here. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our faithful Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, through the ever-present power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Doug, you can come on up and introduce the next few songs. It is good to see everyone here. It is a blessing to be here. Um, this morning, we're going to hear about a people's champ. But in everybody's life, there's someone of influence, whether it be a grandparent, whether it be a parent. And as an elder here, I get the privilege to visit with people and share stories about life. And one life that I shared a story with is Jean Kilstra, already long gone. Uh, for at least a few years, and she shared with me a favorite song of hers, and so we get to sing that one first, Psalm 8. <laughs>
it's very exciting to be up here and hear all your voices. It's incredible. Um, the next song um, I've chosen is from another man in my life. Sorry. Um, Beams of Heaven uh, is from my dad. It's going to be a year in a week or so. And so I'm going to sing a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Doug, for sharing about those songs. I don't know about you all, but it made them instantly more meaningful for me when people are vulnerable and share that. And you almost got me a tear eyed as well. So thank you for that. Today, uh, as we go into our time of confession, 
to God, um, I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I'm going to start by reading Psalm 130, um, and then I'll pray uh, for each of us as we all take this time to bring to Jesus all the mistakes that we made in this past week and let him and respond to what we give him with uh, forgiveness. Let's pray. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. And so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem us from all our sins. Jesus, we admit to you at this time that we're not perfect. And even though it was just a week ago that that we celebrated your resurrection from the dead and that we should still be celebrating that today and, and living in that new light and new direction for our lives, instead we we still so often turn back to to other things, to other things that we know are wrong that we try and satisfy our hearts with, and then we soon find out that they don't satisfy us. Lord, it's different for each one of us what our own vices are, what our own mistakes are, the things we've said that we regretted, the things that we didn't say that we regretted. But God, no matter what it is, you promise that if we bring it to you, if we come to you in confession and repentance, that you wipe it clean, that you wash us white as snow so that we can be new people, resurrected people, living truly in this new life, this new birth that you have given us. In your name we pray, amen. Jesus' sacrifice for our sins that we celebrated just a week ago was not just a one-time thing, it was once and for all. So even though it only happened once in history, it paid for every one of our mistakes, past, present, and future. And so that even though we fall short again and again, we can go to his cross again and again and receive true forgiveness. So be assured of that forgiveness this morning. As we sing this next song once again, I hope we can all go again to Jesus' cross.
So this time, uh, almost tripping up the steps here, <laughs> the uh, children are invited to be dismissed for Sunday school, but before you guys go, I'm going to invite you actually to come up front here with me. It's really fun up front, trust me. And we are all going to pray together uh, for what we're about to learn, so you can come on up front. I'm going to have a seat with you. Okay, guys, so uh, we here in the sanctuary are going to be reading the Bible and learning about God's Word, and you guys, whatever room you're going to, are also going to be reading the Bible and learning something, too, about Jesus. So it's important that we pray and ask God to help us in our learning and in our reading of the Bible. And so I'm going to pray now for you guys and for all of us this morning and for myself who's going to be doing some teaching and for the Sunday school teachers. That's a lot of people to pray for, so let's get started. Lord, please at this time as we go to intentionally read your word and um, try and learn more about what it means to follow Jesus and about who you are, may you speak to us, God. May you speak to us through those who are teaching us in Sunday school, may you give them the words to say, and you may you speak through me this morning, Lord, through the, the words that I've written, through the words that I've prepared. May all of these words that are read about you and that are spoken about you become your living word, a word that doesn't just change what we know, but it changes how we live, and it gives us hope. It's the good news. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so you're dismissed for... Sunday school. So today our, our scripture passage comes from Psalm 146. It's a favorite psalm of mine. We've been doing a lot of psalms this morning, Psalm 8, and I read from Psalm 30, so we're going to continue that trend, uh, and um, we're going to read the entire psalm, and I'll, I'll read it for you now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. And on that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. He frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. In just a couple weeks, on May the 7th, we will celebrate the anniversary of a special day. And maybe some of you might know what May the 7th uh, is a celebration of. Because in 1945, on May the 7th, was the day that the entire country of the Netherlands was liberated from the Nazi occupation. And on that first May the 7th in 1945, well, not the first May the 7th, but many years ago, 77 years ago, in the crowded streets of Utrecht, Canadian soldiers drove and walked around to the elated cheers of Dutch civilians. You see, a few days earlier, the Nazi general in charge of the Netherlands had surrendered to Allied forces, and the news spread quickly as the, and the Dutch anxiously awaited the arrival of their Canadian liberators in the streets. There was not one window that was facing the street in Utrecht that didn't have a Dutch flag in it or at least some orange streamers hanging. 
Because for the people of Utrecht and for the people and living in the rest of the Netherlands, this was the end of a long, bitter, and cruel occupation. I've only just heard a couple stories from my grandparents who all immigrated from the Netherlands, but I know there are many stories of the cruelty and the, yeah, the terribleness of World War II and the Nazi occupation. The Nazis had taken most of the food, the fuel, and most of the young fighting-aged men in the last few years leading up to this. So liberation by the Canadian forces not only meant political justice, but also meant food for hungry people and meant freedom for all those who were in hiding, including the many Jews who were put in hiding during the occupation. For good reason, shouts of praise and joy were heard all around the city as the Canadian forces walked through. One uh, Dutchman who was a teenager at the time remembers this scene. He says, As this Canadian tank came near, there was a hush over all the people. And then all of a sudden, one person let out a huge shout. It was as if it was coming from the depths of the earth. And then people started climbing on the tank, and they were crying tears of joy. And we were running alongside the jeeps and the tanks as they all went into the city. In our text today, we read about a similar time of praise during liberation. The psalmist begins our psalm today with, an overwhelming praise from the depths of their soul, a praise that will continue for the rest of their life, they say. Most scholars believe that this psalm was written after the exiles were returning from Babylon. However, though, almost immediately after the psalmist starts talking about all this praise and joy and celebration, they include words of caution. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings, they say. Why such a serious tone in a time of of joyful ecstasy? Well, we only need keep reading a little further to find out. Because princes, or any human leader, they say, the psalmist says, cannot save you. These human leaders, they return to the dust just like all other living things. Furthermore, their lofty plans that they might have had for the future, eventually, they come to nothing, the psalmist says. Harsh words, right? They come to nothing. They're dust. But they're still true. In the setting of this psalm, what we call today the ancient Near East, there was a lot of hope that people were trying to put in human leaders back then, in kings or princes. And part of why people praised and trusted kings and princes was of the lofty claims that these kings and emperors and rulers would make. You need not look far to find an emperor who lived back then who claimed to be divine or to have immortal status, to be a god. The pharaoh of Egypt, he considered himself a god and was considered by others to be a god. Nebuchadnezzar, we read in the book of Daniel, the king of Babylon, he set up the statue for himself for other people to worship And even though it was a few years later, when the Romans came around, the emperor of Rome also was considered to be one of the gods in their many pantheon of gods that they had. Along with all this arrogance that came along with thinking that you were a god or divine, came with lofty claims about salvation and about good news for the empire and the people that these kings ruled over. And even when they were conquering other nations, when they were subjugating them and and fighting against them during war and taking them into, into slavery, these kings and these civilizations would call it liberation. It's kind of like what's going on in Ukraine right now, where Putin thinks that he's liberating the people there. That's what was happening in the time the psalm was written. And these rulers would, would promise this future peace that would come and prosperity for all people. And yet, that kind of peace, that kind of salvation, it never really came. When the kingdom of Judah was liberated from the Assyrians by the Persians, or by the kingdom of Babylon, then they went under the rule of Babylon not long after. And then when they were liberated from the Babylonians, then they were ruled by the Persians. And then after the Persians, it was the Greeks. And after the Greeks, it was the Romans, and so on and so on and so on. The psalmist, what he points out is a harsh harsh truth about liberation by human powers. 
It's temporary at best, and it's futile at worst. And what's more is that often when these kings and and human princes would come to liberate, they would really only be liberating, if they liberated anyone, the rich and the influential people of society. You know, why bother liberate the poor, the widows, the prisoners, the blind, the disabled? It was much more effective for them, for their selfish wishes to help those who had influence so that those people could keep them in power. And thus, the psalmist makes it clear how the people who are often praised for liberation actually have no business being praised at all. And while we must respect, deeply respect and appreciate our human liberators, such as those soldiers who fought in World War II, we often fall into the very trap that the psalmist warns us about. There's a popular song, uh, well, it was popular a few years ago. I still listen to it a lot because it's by my favorite band, the Arkells, and it's called The People's Champ. That's what I've titled this sermon after. And this song is overtly political in tone, and I think the lyrics kind of fall in line with the truths that are uh, being spoken of in our text this morning. Some of the lyrics go, I can smell it on you, you're some aristocrat. I said it takes a village and you can't handle that. Well, I already know how the history books react. I'm looking for the people's champ and it ain't you. This song gives words to our current longing today in our society for a leader who's going to lead not just in the interest of a few people, but in the interest of all the people. Not just aristocrats or leaders or, or, or rich people in our society. The reason for this song's popularity popularity is not just its catchy tune. We resonate with it because as Canadians and as many other nations around the world, we are truly looking still for that people's champ, for that leader, whether they're elected or not, to actually care for everyone, including us. And the leaders that we have put our trust in temporarily, they have so often let us down, haven't they? How many leaders have we not heard of recently that are caught in scandal? That we thought that they were trustworthy, that they were respectable people with integrity, and we find out that they're just like all the others. And that all their lofty promises that they made starting out, they haven't kept maybe even one or two of them. And while some people might consider this search search for a people's champ just a waste of time, so you might as well just look out for yourself, There's some people in our society, in our communities, who don't have that option to look out for themselves. They need, we, some of us need someone to advocate for our case and to champion our cause. The psalmist in our text from Psalm 146 appears to be speaking from experience when they talk about the marginalized people in society. And that's what the scholars point to, too. They We're just living as an oppressed prisoner, an exile, probably living in Babylon. They probably knew many others who had firsthand experience of what it was like to be a foreigner, a prisoner, an orphan. We too know, some of us know firsthand, or we know others closely who have firsthand experience with what it feels like to be oppressed, to be bowed down, and to be hungry. I uh, used to live in Brampton before I, lived in, before I moved to Ingersoll a year and a half ago. And while I lived there, we would have these prayer meetings in um, uh, this community housing project. And I remember at one meeting, uh, this one woman shared her story at the beginning of the prayer meeting about something that had happened to her during the week. She came out of her door one morning and every single tire on her car had been slashed. And others on her street had their tires slashed too. And we kept talking. I was like, there must be a reason for this. And there was, the more we talked about it, the more it became clear there was no justifiable reason for anyone to have done this to her. I mean, really, there is never a good reason to slash someone's tires. And as I kept talking with her, I said, well, you should go talk to your, the housing board or you should go to the police or talk to your insurance company about it. But the more we talked, the more hopeless it became because as a single mom who was living and riding the poverty line, She didn't have the time 
or the money to do these things. And if she would have tried to go through insurance to pay for it, that means her premiums would have gone up. And I lived in Brampton, Brampton, I know. They have the highest premium, insurance premiums in all of the country. It was amazing when I moved to Ingersoll. It was like slashed in half. And so for this poor woman who had this terrible injustice done to her, my heart just went out to her. I was asking myself, you know, shouldn't there be legal processes to help people like this? Shouldn't there be a way of preventing such crimes from occurring again? How can the people who try so hard to govern well in our provinces and our towns still let us down in moments like this? But it was only a few weeks after that that in my devotions I remember reading Psalm 146. And in it, I knew God was reminding me that I, we do have a liberator whose plans do not fail, who does reign eternally, and who truly is the people's champ. And that's Jesus. That's our God, our Trinitarian God and Father. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord, their God. The Lord is a ruler who stands above all other earthly rulers. The psalmist begins by reminding the Jews of who, who this psalm was originally written to, of the Lord's powerful past actions. And this should have been such a basic knowledge for them as they would have repeated it so often in their, in their oral traditions. But yet it was still important that they reminded themselves of it, that God reminded them about it regularly. And so when the psalmist says, the Lord is the maker of the heavens and earth and he is the God of Jacob, it would have reminded them of all the times in the past where even though the Israelites were going through difficult times where they were oppressed, where they were living as slaves in Egypt, God saw them. He heard their cries for justice and mercy, and he delivered them. He gave them true salvation. When the people of Israel had been let down by human leaders in the past who could not save them, who could not sustain them, the psalmist reminds them that God was the one who had been sustained them all along. And he's going to continue to sustain them going on into the future. And what's more, the Lord is not like human kings and princes who ignore or discriminate against certain people in society, against the poor and the marginalized. The majority of the psalm is a list of all the many groups of people who would easily be overlooked by a human ruler, like the king of Babylon, but actually, the psalmist says, God favors these people. God upholds the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. He frees the prisoner. He heals the blind. He lifts up those who are bowed down. He watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. Amen to that. The Lord, the God of Jacob, is so great a liberator that he cares even for those that so many others don't care for. The Lord, our Lord, is also a God of action. I encourage you as you go home today or the rest of this week, read Psalm 146 again and look for all the different verbs and, and action words that it describes God doing for his people. You'll find quite a few. I count 10 different actions that God makes in just verses 6 through 9. When the supposed new world order of kings like Nebuchadnezzar or Caesar are proclaimed, the psalmist reminds God's people that the reign of God, his world order, is actually far greater than those. And when those kings inevitably, when all the rulers inevitably let you down, you can turn to the Lord, the God of Jacob, because he reigns forever. And even today, when our presidents or our prime ministers or our premiers or our governors or whoever it is let us down, we can look to our God who is the true embodiment of the people's champ. We can also remember what God has already done for us and our lives and the lives of other people who have gone before us and say, it's okay. God's got us. Our Lord Jesus incarnated. That's a that's a word, a theological term for embodied, what it means to care for everyone, including the poor and the marginalized. 
Jesus gave literal sight to those who are blind. And he gave figurative sight to those who are spiritually blind, and he still does so today. Jesus fed the hungry with his miracle of the multiplication of fish and loaves. Jesus set prisoners of demons free, and even one of those prisoners was literally in chains when Jesus set him free. Jesus began a kingdom here on earth that shows no partiality to the nobility and those with, inf- with, those with influence. In the kingdom of God, we read that actually... Blessed are the poor, Jesus said. Just like in Psalm 146, in God's kingdom, the righteous are among the meek and the oppressed. So we have hope for the future today, just like the original audience of Psalm 146. We have hope that one day our people's champ will return and he will set all things right again. We are given glimpses of this future hope. That when we look at the work of Jesus' body here on earth, the church, as the Holy Spirit continues Jesus building Jesus' kingdom here. In his book, Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson describes a story of hope and justice that points to his and our real people's champ, Jesus. You see, Brian is a lawyer. Now, I know lawyers aren't always the type of people that we are conditioned to love and trust. Hopefully there are not any lawyers here this morning. (laughs) But you see, Brian, he was the type of lawyer who, because of what Jesus had taught him about God's love for prisoners, he looked to uphold the cause of the oppressed and to see prisoners set free. So in his book, Just Mercy, Brian tells the true story of a man named Walter McMillan. Walter is a, was a man from Alabama who was wrongfully convicted for the murder of two women, and he was sentenced to death. And there are many factors going into this wrongful conviction of Walter McMillan, but the most significant one was, unfortunately, race. You see, Walter was a black man in a relationship with a white woman. And when the police had no other leads in the death of these two other white women, their first person that they thought to look to was Walter. He was an easy culprit. And so Brian, as he hears the story of Walter, he does his work pro bono, which means free of charge. And that was really the only way that Walter and his family could afford this important legal work to really fight for Walter's life. And at risk of spoiling the book, and also uh, this is a movie on Netflix too if you want to watch it. It's called Just Mercy. I'm going to share with you what happens in the end. I'm, I'm sure you'll still watch it and enjoy it. Due to the dogged persistence of Ryan and his legal team, and due to Jesus' work in the hearts of the judges and the juries who worked on the case, Brian and Walter and his whole family were given a real present hope. Because when Walter's case was brought up for appeal, all the previous charges against him were overturned. And this prisoner, who was on death row, was set free. You see, Brian Stevenson, the lawyer who fought for Walter's case, he doesn't claim to be the people's champ. And I don't think many of those Canadian veterans who fought in Holland in World War II, they claim to be the people's champ either. Because Brian and most of them probably knew that there is a God who is far stronger than them. There is a God who liberates prisoners, who feeds the hungry, who cares about foreigners and the oppressed. And we get glimpses of this liberation today. But we will see the fulfillment of this kingdom of God in the future. I think all of us can resonate with the truth that our sin had each of us on death row. Because of Jesus taking our place on that cross and going to the grave for us, he set each one of us free on his appeal. The Lord our God is our hope, and he is deserving of all our praise. He is the real people's champ.
Amen. Before we, oh, as the uh, youth go to, to, to swag, it's called, that's a cool name, swag. As the youth go to swag, and before we sing the next song, I'm just going to say a quick prayer, uh, again, asking God to apply this truth to our lives. Lord, we thank you that you care for us, even the least among us. You see them, and they are an equal part of your family. Lord, I pray that you open each one of our eyes to those people to people we often overlook that we don't care about, to the people that we have written off in our society. Help us to be your hands and feet here on earth, to declare to others that you are their champion, that you see them, that you care for their case and their cause. Lord, thank you that you have liberated each one of us from the powers of sin and death, and that someday we too will live in glory with you. Amen. Thank you very much for that message. Just got home from a long plane ride from Uganda last week, and guess what the movie on the plane was? Just Mercy. And the sound of those cups clanging against the bars as he's liberated, it just, yeah, resonated. So thank you for sharing even a bigger truth of our a true leader. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege to come before you in prayer. We thank you for this Lord's Day and this opportunity to worship in this building or in the quiet of our homes. Thank you for the blessing of the message that Pastor Ellen's brought to us. May we be encouraged and strengthened by knowing we worship a God who sees the cause of the oppressed. So thank you for being our faithful God and leader. Lord, you are an awesome creator God with your splendor ever, evident everywhere we look. Thank you for the seasons, for the evidence of spring and warmer weather, for the brilliance of tulips and daffodils and new buds on trees that bring a smile to our face. And yet, Lord, even with the sunshine, we know that there is also uh, sadness and suffering in this world. So we want to pray now for a de-escalation from war and for the safety of the people in Ukraine and in Russia. May your peace be restored. Lord, you're an awesome God, and you love and care for each of us. We thank you that you think of our needs, whether great or small. We thank you that Ellie could have her knee surgery on Friday, and we pray for strength and healing for her. May she be free from the chronic pain that has been a part of her life for so many months. Thank you that Heiko successfully had a new heart uh, pacemaker implanted this week, and we pray for continued healing. Thank you for the blessings of new birth for a new little granddaughter, for Andy Tadema, and for a new little great-grandson, for Rhonda Young. Bless little baby Ezra as he struggles with life. Also strengthen the parents as they helplessly wait for further news. 
And so, Lord, it was good to hear this morning that the news is um, promising. So we pray, can, can you, uh, physical healing to Mom Kendra after this traumatic birth. Lord, we pray for those struggling with chronic health issues. We also pray for those dealing with anxiety, stress, and mental health issues. Lord, as our offering today goes to the GEMS ministry, we thank you for their devotion to bringing the good news of Jesus to girls around the world and their mission in bringing girls into a living, dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. Now that COVID restrictions are lessening, may we look forward to a renewal of the GEMS program here at the Junction as well. As the Council seeks nominations for elders and deacons, we pray for your leading. May godly men and women be found willing and able to lead this congregation. We pray for our pastor search committee as they plan for the next steps in growth and transition for the junction. We pray for good participation in our congregational meeting this Thursday. Bless our speaker as she shares information about Grace Cafe and the Annex. Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath day. May we go forth rejoicing in the salvation we have in you. May you be praised. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close this time of worship, God sends each of us out into his kingdom, reminding us that he is our champion and that we get to be his hands and feet. So I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and receive this blessing and encouragement from our God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace now and forever. All God's people say, Amen. Amen.